From a prisoner of the United States government to one of its most influential leaders, Norman Mineta's path to public service has not been your traditional one. He was born in San Jose, California in the early 1930s, but after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, the U.S. military sent him and his family, along with more than 110,000 other Japanese Americans, citizens, to internment camps around the country. After the war, Mineta and his family moved back to San Jose, where they slowly rebuilt their lives. From there, he quickly jumped into public service, first as student body president, and by joining the Army, then as the first non-white member of the San Jose City Council, and later as the country's first ever Asian-American mayor of a major city. In 1974, Mineta was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, where he co-founded the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and led the fight for the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, which granted reparations to Japanese Americans sent to internment camps. And in the 2000s, he went on to serve in two presidential cabinets, first in the Clinton administration. I'm pleased to bring you here to announce my nomination of Norm Mineta to be the 33rd Secretary of Commerce. Thank him for accepting my invitation to serve again. Then, as you just saw, as Secretary of Transportation in the George W. Bush administration, where he served during the 9-11 terrorist attacks, his story of service and sacrifice is the focus of a new good documentary. It's called Norman Mineta and His Legacy in American Story. He joined me yesterday during Asian Pacific American Heritage Month and just ahead of the film's release on PBS. Secretary, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks so much for being here. So you have lived, I watched on that film, a lifetime of firsts. I knew it before, but I hadn't seen all of them. Whether it's the mayor, member of Congress, those two cabinet positions. As I'm watching you, I'm asking myself, is that man thinking of the little 11-year-old boy at those moments? Were you thinking about yourself as a kid? In a way, you do. But the big thing is that I've lived my bucket list. <laughs> and... Uh, I've had a lot of great mentors and friends um, who have pushed, cajoled, kicked, whatever, to help me out uh, in, in all these things I've done. You know, one of the things that struck me, many things struck me in the film, George Takei was sitting in that chair about a year ago when his play Allegiance, about his sure. own family's Absolutely. internment, uh, started playing in Boston. And one of the first things I asked him was, how bitter are you? And he, and I'm paraphrasing, he says, I'm not bitter at right. all. From watching the film, you don't appear to be bitter either. Why is that, Secretary? Well, first of all, I think just within the culture of uh, the Japanese uh, culture, there are things like obey authority, uh, gaman, sort of put up with what you have to do, shigata uh, ganai. There are things that are going to happen to you over which you have no control, and you get, it's sort of a, I guess, Asian fatalistic approach in a way. Is it hard to live that way? Well, the thing is that we were under such pressure to prove our loyalty mm -hmm. to the United States of America. And so uh, we just had to be that way. So when you hear uh, almost everybody who's asked in this country, who are the greatest presidents who ever lived? Abraham Lincoln's generally first. FDR is second, the same FDR who signed executive order, what was it, 9066? That's right. That interned you and your family. Right. What's your reaction to that? Well, again, it was under the circumstance of war. Uh, we had a commanding general of the Western Civil Defense Command who didn't like Japanese. He had coined the phrase, once a JAP, always a JAP. And he figured if they were able to attack Hawaii, they would probably be able to attack the West Coast mm -hmm. of the United States. And what do I do with 120,000 people in Washington, Oregon, and California? So he took the executive order and commandeered racetracks and fairgrounds to intern people because they had built-in living quarters, namely horse stables. Mm -hmm. So how far have we come in 75 years in this country, Secretary Manuva? Well, I'd like to think we've come a long way, but 9-11 occurred, and I all of a sudden see the same kind of things. Keep Middle Easterners off airplanes, ban Muslims from flying, uh, talk about even maybe the possibility of rounding them up. And well, you I, also wrote about family separation. I oh, think absolutely. Magazine absolutely. 
And you I see that as a variation on a theme, essentially. Same, same theme. You know, you mentioned 9-11, and uh, as you well know, President Bush, who uh, I think it was his finest moment in many ways, including going to a mosque and trying to tamp down all the anti-Muslim feeling, he gives a huge amount of credit, as you know, to you uh, uh, for him understanding the issues and the prejudice in such a way that he acted ad, as he did. What kinds of conversations did you have with President Bush? Well, he had invited my wife and me up to Camp David in March of 2001. And so at dinner time, he said, hey, Norm, tell me about evacuation and internment. And so <clears throat> here's a person who doesn't go to sleep early, but he likes to retire, let's say, 9 o'clock. And that night, we stayed up probably three, three and a half hours, 10 o'clock, still talking about evacuation. So uh, uh, you start the film with one of my, I guess I was going to say one of my favorite topics, but it's my least favorite topic, is the partisanship in this country and say the compromise has become <clears throat> a dirty word. Have you ever seen it this bad in your lifetime? No, not at all. And how uh, do we fix this? Part of it, I think, is a schedule. The Congress convenes on a Tuesday at 6.30 uh, for the first vote. They're there Wednesday, and they leave Thursday morning. So they don't get to know each other. They really don't know the subject matters of the committees they're assigned to, and they're relying on their staff, they're relying on outside lobbyists. And there's not time to build the kinds of personal no. relationships. We used to fight in subcommittee, full committee, rules committee, house floor, slap each other on the back, say, come on, let's go have dinner, let's go have a drink. Can we talk, you know, you were very successful in many ways working across the aisle, particularly on the Civil Liberties Act, as I mentioned, of 88. But you had a head start on, on that because there's a guy who used to do a television show right here, a United States senator from uh, Wyoming. You can tell the backstory in a second. Here is Senator Simpson talking about his uh, House colleague, then Congressman Norman Mineta. All I do remember is he has the same, I'm not even looking at him, Right now, he has the same look in his eyes that he did then, which is deviltry, peskiness. It's been one wonderful, rich ride of true friendship, which is a beautiful thing. And the backstory here, which is remarkable, you're in Wyoming in a concentration camp, a Boy Scout, and a local Boy Scout, little, well, he was never little, young Alan Simpson comes, and that was the beginning of your relationship. Our scout leaders had written to the scouts in Ralston, Deaver, Powell, Cody, all the towns surrounding Heart Mountain. He said, come on in for our jamboree. Everyone said, no, 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 we're not going to go in there. There's barbed wire all around the fence, all around the camp. There were these um, security um, guard towers with searchlights and machine gun mounts. And then all of a sudden, a troop from Cody, Wyoming came in. And we did the knot tying contest, the woodworking contest. And then we got paired off with a kid from the Boy Scout troop. And so we put up our pup tent and it could rain any time in a Cody. So you have to build a moat to protect the uh, tent. And then he said, there's a kid in my troop that's in that tent below us. And he's a real bully. I'm wondering if you would mind if we cut the water to exit that way. There was no skin off my nose, so I said, sure. <laughs> so we built a beautiful moat, cut the water to exit down that way, and as luck would have it, it started raining. And our moat worked perfectly, and the water drained down there, and then all of a sudden the tent pegs pulled on the tent below, and Alan's in the tent with me going, ha, 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 he, 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 <laughs> ho, ho, ho. And I finally said to him, would you please shut up so we get some rest? And from that point on, the rest we is just history. absolutely... How long was it until you saw each other again? 1978, when he got elected to the Senate. That's an incredible story. You know, another incredible story is I learned from the film that that American flag on your lapel is always there. Why do you wear it all the time, Secretary? Well, I'm proud to be an American, and I'm also proud of being of Japanese ancestry. But I still am treated like a foreigner. I'm a U.S. citizen, 
and you know, you get in the elevator and people look you over and and you get that feeling, well, so in any event, I am proud to wear the American flag. And that doesn't the end where we began, that doesn't engender anger in you? Not really. I mean, to me, what this country is all about is opportunities. The ability to be able to <clears throat> live out a dream. And so whether you're a woman or a young person, a minority, regardless of where you live, you want to have that opportunity for everybody. You're an amazing man. You've done great things for this country. Secretary, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thank it's you great so to be much. with you. Norman Mineta and his legacy in American Story premieres right here on WGVH2 on Monday, May 20th at 9 p.m.